Welcome to Women With Drive, a podcast from the Deakin Melbourne Boomers, talking all things women's hoops, hosted by Boomer's own Lou Brown. Hi, everyone, and thank you for listening into another episode of Women With Drive. I'm your host, Lou Brown, and today we are back with very special guest, Michelle Timms, to talk a little post-Olympics. So thanks, thanks for coming back and joining me, Timsy. Nah, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure indeed, but what an action-packed couple of weeks. I, I almost feel as if we all felt the adrenaline of the Olympics and now feeling the come down a little bit too. So I wish we had time to be able to go through some of the highlights through all the sports, but unfortunately we wouldn't have the time. So I'll throw it to you, Timsy. Out of the entire two weeks, what was your highlight for Tokyo 2020? Well, I mean, I think for me, um, one thing when I think of these Olympics, I mean, I think of a lot of things, but one thing is the, one of the greatest comebacks of all time, which was Hassan in that 1500 metre, oh, when yeah. she got tripped over and then sprinted through to the end line. That was um, one of my highlights, but looking more at Australia and what we were able to achieve, obviously in the pool, that was amazing that first week. Um, I fell in love with a few things, the Matildas, the um, uh, huge on the skateboarding, love that. Yeah. Love seeing something in there. Um, but of course, for me, nothing beats the Boomers, the winning the very first medal for the Australian men's team. That was the highlight for me. Uh, I agree. It was there was a lot of inspirational moments throughout the Olympics. Um, but let's let's switch gears straight to the Opals. We we obviously saw them go down to the US in the quarterfinals, ending their Oly- Olympic uh, campaign with a one and three record. Now, after watching the Opals over the course of the Olympics, what was one of your key takeaways from their campaign? Um, oh, one key, there was quite a few, but I think we, um, we need to become better defensively, that's for sure. Um, look, it's a really interesting uh, thought process around the Opals because so much happened, you know. We are tantalised by the proceedings that went before the Olympics with how they played against the USA sort of had a bit of false hope then but I think anyone's a hooper knew that to be able to recreate that for two weeks was going to be you know pretty tough um and then switching gears from okay we've established uh that the culture comes first but then on the other hand how do you deal with with losing only coming through with a one win three loss record and, and balancing those emotions as a spectator has been you know quite tricky um but i think i think definitely it, it's a time to rebuild i think it's exciting for the the future of, of the game um we now get a chance very quickly i might add to uh regroup and um and you know we've got that Asian Cup coming up yeah. very soon. We've got the World Cup coming up next year in our own backyard. And then, of course, three years in, in three years' time, we've got the Olympics. So um, it, there is a lot to do, but it is very exciting, you know, and we can talk about the ins and outs and who and what, um, definitely. But it's an ex- putting all that away, it's a really exciting time for the future of the game in, in our what I think will be a rebuild. Right, there's not there's so much of a quick turnaround. It doesn't really give much time for the dust to settle after the Olympics. But um, so who do you think was a standout for the Opals? Um, that's another toughie because I think we had a lot that had cameo appearances. Um, I think that uh, one that flashes to mind was Taylor George, yep. and uh, you know she played some some great minutes in, in different, you know, different games. And definitely the game against Puerto Rico was like, wow, you know, her and Tolo were, were super. And um, look, I, I really, um, really fell in love with Katie Ebersary. I thought that she was a bit of a surprise package for yeah. me. Even though I've seen her in the green and gold many times, I thought she was really um, strong for us. I thought that her defense was, was real critical for us in an area that re- we really, um, we lacked on so many levels. I thought she was a bit of a, a shining light for us. And then of course, early in the tournament, I thought Ezzy was super as well. So um, she showed that she's ready to ready to go and her, it's gonna be so exciting to follow her journey over the next three years before Paris. No, absolutely. And then, so you would have watched the, the gold medal game between the US and Japan. 
Uh, what were your impressions of that game and especially Japan, considering I've heard some people describe them to have such beautiful basketball to watch um, and even more so since they were missing a couple of their best players. But what did you think of them? Well, I thought they were super. I, I actually had them as a medal contender um, at the start. So I was very happy to see them go all the way and, and get a silver, having faced so much adversity, like you say, Takashiki wasn't there and uh, one of their other point guards and being so small, but finding a way and, and staying true to their style of, of game. And Tommy Hovas is, a, is just a great coach and someone that I truly admire seeing his journey with that team. You know, he was assistant coach for many years and then took the helm. And um, they've straight stayed true to their identity, which is, you know, pushing the ball at every opportunity, you know, being accurate from the from the long range. And um, I guess just defensively really mixing it up and throwing full court presses and trapping over the half on the first pass and, and really um, trying to plug the holes that their lack of height presents. So I thought that Tommy Hovas did a really good job coaching that team. And they were super excited. You know, these yeah. kids played... They had fun, you know, they, they played with high energy for every second they were out there. Um, they were defensively focused, which I love. And um, they were definitely probably the most exciting team out there and, and hats off to Japan and what they were able to achieve. Yeah, it was just to know it was only their fifth Olympic women basketball tournament appearance and obviously their first gold medal match appearance. So to come out and do that, it was it was really beautiful to watch and um but also in that game, obviously, there was Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird um, potentially most likely competing in what could be their fifth and final Olympics um, and even considered an end of an Olympic era. So how do you see women's basketball on the international stage progressing in the years to come? Oh, look, I think it's just going to get just as, you know, continue to evolve as it has since since we were back playing in the, you know, way back in 88, you know, the games really evolved with especially the athleticism of the players. Um, so um, to identify exactly which way it's going to head, I'm not sure, <laughs> but, you know, but um, it's definitely changed a lot from, from my day. Um, you know, the flexibility of players, what made the Americans so great was, you know, I'm a massive fan of Stuart. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, she's somebody that can play anywhere from the, the two through to the, the five. And, and I really like the way that um, that the USA weren't afraid to switch and use their length against the point guards. <laughs> so we, for a lot of time in that USA game, we had, um, you know, Sue Bird had switched down onto the post on an on ball and Griner would just carry her big hand on the point guard and use her length to space the point guard. So she couldn't make that obvious pass to the mismatch. So. Um, I, I was I was quite impressed with the way um, the Americans game plan went and that they they weren't afraid to to switch against the zippier point guards but of, of Japan who caused so many teams so many problems um, I also like the fact that uh, you know you've got your Brianna Stewart Stewart and AJ Wilson and Griner I mean that was always going to be a big thing for how the Japanese you know that was the area I thought they were going to get fight or struggle to handle the, the most. And um, having those big players being able to play on the perimeter just yeah. was um, real key for America. And I think, like, you know, you talk about the style of game and it's always been progressing that way, that your bigs can play outside, your bigs can be flexible, the bigs shoot the three. And I, and I think it'll continue to evolve like that. Women with drive. Now, lastly, Timsey, looking forward for the Opals. We talk, You mentioned uh, this a little bit earlier, but obviously we've got... Asia Cup, World Cup in Sydney next year. Uh, what's in store for the future of the Opals and what do you think will need to happen as they prepare for the World Cup and onwards for to Paris 2024? Well, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's a, it's um, it's like you said, it's such a quick turnaround and um, BA and Sandy need, are going to have to get together and determine, you know, which way they want to go with this, you know, um, You've got, uh, I would think that there needs to be probably a, a little bit of a reshuffle of personnel and uh, there, there can be a reshuffle of personnel as we slide into the, the Asia Cup, which isn't going to be easy at all because they, re, you know, they've got to face Japan and China again and then also New Zealand. But, um, you know, just on the back of the reflection of those Olympics, I think that it's probably a chance for some, some kids back here to 
to have a run. Um, I'm not sure where the players are going to be going, whether they, you know some of the current Opals will be heading overseas, but I think it's a really good chance to to slide Heel and Rochi and Nicholson and Kuzo and you know we've got a we've got a lot. Like to me, it's exciting because we do have a lot of young kids who can. Um, and even though Nicholson's not young, we've got a lot of players back here who can slide in and and get some international experience and. Um, you know, play the Asia Cup and then roll in, continuing the, continuing what I think we need is a bit of a rebuild into the World Cup and then be ready, hopefully, for, for Paris and have a, uh, you know, qualify through and, and have a better, um, better tournament than we've had this time without, hopefully, as much adversity. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tim Z, again for your time. It's always a pleasure and I just love picking your brain. Thanks for having me, Lou. Thank you. It's been 10 years since we won a championship. We've been so close. She misses as well. Townsville, hang on. This year, it's our time. This year, we're back. In Melbourne, in front of you, our fans. You bring the energy. You bring the noise. You bring the passion. We'll bring the game. We'll bring the proof. Okay, let's reel it back in. And as we switch gears, so will Women With Drive. And have I got a couple of things for our listeners and watchers to look forward to. So what's to come? Women With Drive will take a little bit of a different angle for some of our next episodes, with our first one next week. I'm going to be getting Melbourne Boomers player and my teammate, and toll phone, Panina Davidson, in the studio, where we'll get a chance to know her a bit and engage in some different conversations, maybe even outside of basketball. Then fingers crossed we can get Tess Madgen on here once she's back in Melbourne out of her quarantine stint post-Olympics. Then throughout the month of September, there's even more basketball to look forward to. We have the WNBA playoffs where we'll be following Ezzy at Seattle and the Melbourne Boomers WNBA imports, Tiff Mitchell and Lindsay Allen from the Indiana Fever. We're obviously, we're hoping to watch a couple of the Melbourne Boomers girls and other Aussies in the league make a run through those playoffs. Then I'll be able to get one of them on the show too. Now, of course, our NBL one playoffs. Now seriously hoping we can play that out this year. We've had a pretty disrupted season due to COVID. So it'd be more than ideal to be able to finish this season out smoothly and get a chance to play out the national championships. I know the NBL one leagues all around Australia are really hoping that'll be the case, but obviously only time will tell. But thank you everyone for sticking with another episode of Women With Drive. Make sure to stay tuned and subscribe as next week we'll have something a little different, as I mentioned, with guest and player Panina Davidson dropping in for a chat. Thanks for listening to Women With Drive, hosted by Lou Brown. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could, leave us a review.